Good afternoon, everybody. Love seeing those smiling and familiar faces here on Zoom today. Uh, welcome. It is a tremendous pleasure that I welcome, with tremendous pleasure, that I welcome you to our third ever Community Health Talk. Dr. Lopez and the CHWs decided to create this series as a way to gather everyone together to talk about difficult and complex topics um, in a safe space. This activity is a requirement for our 2021 cohort. If you are a 2021 cohort, if you're 2020, this will count as an elective credit. Uh, over the next 90 minutes, we will uh, discuss domestic, domestic violence from a cultural lens. Um, more importantly, we'll be able to spend valuable one-on-one -on -one time with each of our community health workers in attendance tonight. Please do not waste this opportunity. Take advantage to consult, learn, and share with them. Uh, we're going to dive right in. Allow me to introduce our director, Dr. Lopez, who will guide our session tonight. Thank you, Dr. Lopez. Hello, everyone. Yay, welcome. I can't believe we're doing this again. It seems like yesterday was December and it's already, yes, let's not even um, dwell on it. But um, yeah, what a pleasure because the, what's special about this evening, you know, is the interaction. So it's not just about, you know, slides or things. And we are having a conversation here and we're having a conversation based on the topic and also the video, you know, that was, that was prepared for this, um, for this subject. So with that given out as a, as, a, as a preamble, I wanna also say, please don't, you know, don't be shy. Don't, don't be like, oh, you can chat it, you can say it. Um, and um, nothing is said, you know, not, what's wrong is what's not said. It's important to emote things too. If things are too heavy and you need to leave for a second, come back in, that's also okay, all right? So when things are thick, you, you'll notice, you know, students know that I breathe. I have to, you know, breathe what is being said because it's difficult. It's not, you know, it's not, we're not talking about pie and cake. We're talking about, see, now I'm gonna make you hungry, sorry. We're talking about things that are important and of substance. So I'm so glad for your attendance. And so now I would like to introduce um, Jenny Arones and Kathy Wolfsfeld, who will be moderating, so to speak, or facilitating the discussion tonight. Either one is gonna take it. You, you're gonna begin, who? Jenny or Kathy? Kathy. Well, good evening. <laughs> Thank you. We flipped the coin, but I lost it. So I guess I'll go first. <laughs> I'm Kathy Wolfsfeld and I am a community health worker with the African-American community. And I'm so glad to be here to talk about this important issue on domestic violence. Jenny? Hello everyone, my name is Jenny Arones. I'm also a community health worker. Uh, working right now at Salt Lake County Health Department, I represent proudly the Hispanic community, and I'm really excited to share and to, you know, have this conversation. It's always very beneficial to be a contribution. Thank you so much. Should we go around and introduce ourselves briefly, briefly? Okay, I'm gonna call you out because you don't know in what order. Let's see. Let's start with Mr. Castillo. Uh, my name is Pete. I'm a PA student at the university, uh, second year. Uh, is there anything else I should? No, that's pretty about. much, that's good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Rudy. Hi everyone, this is Prudvi Marnidi. I'm in my final semester of MPH at U. I'm also doing my internship with Office of Primary Care and Rural Health as a health provider data and research specialist. And yep, that's pretty much about me. I'm originally from India. Third students, both of them. Um, Sherry. Oh. I am sorry, I'm a DMP student at the University of Utah. I'm in my second year. 
Sí, oh. uh -huh. okay. uh, representing Pacific Islands uh, from Hawaii and moved here to Utah six years ago. And we lucky. Um, Maria Guadarrama. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Guadarrama, originally from Mexico. Um, also work with the Hispanic community and um, I also uh, help with enrollments for health insurance through the organization that I work with. Nice to meet you all. Welcome. Tori? Hi, my name is Tori. I'm a first year PA student. Good, welcome. Um, Jason? Yeah, it's Jason. I'm also a first year PA student at the University of Utah. Welcome, Jason. Valentin. Valentin, we can hear you. Yes, sorry. I'm Valentin Mukundene. I'm working with Best of Africa, serving African refugees. Thank you so much. Welcome, um, Jeanette. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeanette Villalta, and I'm a CHW working with the Hispanic community for the last 22 years. Nice Ryan. to meet you. Ryan, please. You're mute. Mr. Benali, go ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Ryan Benoli. I'm with the <clears throat> CHW program certification here in San Juan County. Welcome, thank you. Tatiana, should you introduce yourself? I don't know. I'm Tatiana Allen, program manager for the Utah HIC, and I think they've had enough of me already. <laughs> okay, Chanel. Hi, my name is Chanel. I'm a PA student, first year at the University of Utah. Olivia. Hi. I don't know. Can, can you hear me? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm driving, so. <laughs> but um, my name's Olivia, and I'm a social work major at Weaver State University, and this is my last year, so. I'm Hi, excited. Olivia. Welcome, welcome. Ashley Eiffel. Hi, I was just. Hi, okay, sorry, just switching from my phone to my computer because I just got home. Um, my name is Ashley. I'm a first year PA student at the University of Utah as well. Excellent. What an entrance, girl. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Andrea Ferran. Hi, my name's Andrea. I'm a first year rad tech student at Slick. Welcome, welcome. Teresa. Hi, everyone. My name is Teresa Sanchez. I am a health equity specialist working with the Office of Health Disparities. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you so much, Teresa. Tania? Hi, I'm Tanya Oliveira. I'm a DNP student at the U. Okay. Welcome, Pile. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tila Fangatella. I'm a community health worker with um, representing the Pacific Islander community. I'm happy to share space with you folks. Thank you. Thank you. Farida? Hi, my name is Farida Gulam Jilani. I'm, I represent Afghan community. Welcome, Farida. Oscar. Uh oh. Well, we can come back to him. Jamie? Oh, no, you're here. Okay, Oscar. Oh, no, se oye. We can't hear you.
All right, let me get um, Jamie Richards and then we get back to you. Oh, Jamie. Oh boy. Blake. Okay. All right, so is that everyone? All right, so for the, um, those of you, show of hands who saw the video. And so um, I don't know, do we have time to show it briefly or no? Uh, we do, Dr. Lopez. Let Oscar. me get it set up. Yeah, would you please so? And um, uh, Oscar is saying hi from the chat. If somebody, if Jenny or Kathy would read that while I find the video really quick. Oscar is saying, sorry, I don't know if my mic is working. <laughs> well, it isn't, Oscar. And I'm a second year MPH student and also an AHEC scholar, have had the privilege to be a student for multiple classes with Dr. Lopez. <laughs> Thing. He okay. made it through somehow. And Jamie Richard says, sorry, didn't know that we couldn't hear. Okay, so a few kinks to work out maybe. You guys work, try to work with the microphone um, icon and the, the little carrot, the little arrow, up arrow that's next to it. Um, sometimes if you have used headphones, then it remains in the headphone setting and then you can't be heard, so take the time. Okay, here it is. Domestic violence in the African-American community may stem from a lack of belonging. You may get the sense that love or discipline are being confused with abuse. Although it's not accepted outright, the person's culture has the potential of permitting violence as a result of generational trauma, a kind of psychological distress that carries through families without proper acknowledgement and intervention. Pandemics serve as a breeding ground for heightened tension and distress for all parties involved. Half of the Latina women who experience abuse never reported because of challenges like anti-migration laws. When a woman immigrates to this country, they are not familiar with laws, resources, or how to access healthcare. Culturally, machismo is common. Men feel entitled to control and violence, which includes emotional, physical, financial, and spiritual violence or abuse. Shame and guilt for the victims are major reason why help is not looked for leading to a cycle. Usually, their families are the last ones to know anything unhealthy is happening in their home. In indigenous cultures, women are seen as a caretaker and protectors of the family, but violence can affect the cultural belonging of an abused woman. Men are often seen as a provider of the family and abuse from a female partner can cause a sense of weakness and loss of pride. Abuse and violence can be normalized within a family. Obstacles include victims being refused their support systems, money, and other resources.
gender, as we see in other communities, plays a major role in how domestic violence is perceived and experienced in the Pacific Islander community. If a man is abusive to his wife, it may be accepted as a part of his dominant role in the family, while a husband who is abused by his wife is seen as weak or submissive. Culturally, Stern disciplining is widespread, and it is believed tougher discipline leads to stronger and wiser members of society. Education and faith are keys to empowering individuals towards healthier relationships. In the African culture, uh, men believe that their women are their properties. Uh, you can, men can do whatever they want, whenever they want. So when they get here, they, some of them still have that mentality and they end up by getting in trouble, um, let's say for beating their wives or by in, in, insulting them uh, physically and uh, women have realized that they have more freedom here than what they had back home. So they, they know that they can call the police if they are being abused. When events that happened many years or decades ago to older or deceased family members that affect the reality of their kin today, this is known as generational trauma. The act of and harm resulting from domestic violence can unfortunately be passed on from one generation to the next with ease. A pandemic has the potential to be a breeding ground for the exacerbation of domestic violence and its harmful effects. Victims have an increased obligation to be at home with their abusive partners or other relative with very few opportunities to seek help. In many Hispanic societies, machismo is prevalent. This is a sort of masculine pride that has been increasingly viewed as misogynistic and toxic. Though it has a name in the Hispanic culture, this concept is seen reflected in other cultures too and is sometimes associated with the origins of a domestically violent family dynamic. In the vast majority of cultures, women are more often the victims of domestic abuse than men are. However, it mustn't be discounted that men can also be victimized, whether that be at the hands of a female partner, male partner, or another family member. Any person's claims that they are experiencing domestic violence should be addressed with great sensitivity. Thank you so much, everyone. And um, so breathe and on we go. A little lift work, Cammy. Guys, I can already tell this is gonna be so comfortable. I have the support of wearing a bra, but I don't feel like I'm wearing I don't think that was meant for our call. <laughs> I apologize. My YouTube kept playing, sorry about that. <laughs> Oh, I hate when that happens. Oh my gosh. All right. Me too. We do have a couple of questions. One question is why, what reasons have victims. Do the lift? Pardon? Same. It's the same thing. What are reasons victims cannot leave? Is the question. Um, there are so many reasons. You know, they, they usually when the victim is controlled, they're, they usually do not work outside the home, um, especially with the pandemic when everyone was isolated, there was nowhere to go. They couldn't reach out to anyone and that put more isolation on them. Um, you know, when you're, when you're free to go out to work, you're free to talk to people outside of your household. You're free to engage with people. And when you're being controlled and manipulated and 
verbally, physically abused, what have you, all of that is taken from you and you're suddenly isolate, isolated. You don't have employment anymore. Um, sometimes you don't have transportation without your partner or um, whoever is going to drive you or supply you with money to go anywhere. You don't have any funds to do anything. And so you're kind of stuck. And it is a between a rock and a hard place. And, you know, especially the pandemic, like I said, it highlighted the isolation that people was, they were going through. And, you know, that just, that, that made everything exacerbated with mental health. You know, people were depressed so much more significantly. Suicides were up, you know, things like that since the um, pandemic started. And so it's, it's a huge thing to, um, to feel like you're trapped in your own home and that you don't have the freedom to seek help, that you're being so controlled that you don't have a voice anymore and you get, they tend to get lost and they don't have their identity anymore. Yanni, do you have anything to add on that with um, the Hispanic? In my experience with the Hispanic community, I seen people stay in the relationship because of the immigration situation. Another thing is because we have our family that is far away and we consider uh, the person who is abusing us is considered our only family. So it's hard for us to leave because if we leave that person who is abuse, who's abusing, we feel like we are not going to have any more the only representation of the family that is here for us. This is one of the reasons that is strong that I've seen in my clients. I also wanted to add, I mean, that's a loaded question. Um, power and control is, is the basis, I think, of all of it. But whether it's a, ma a male or a female um, who the per is the perpetrator, a lot of it is dependence of the victim on the on the perpetrator. They depend on them for everything, and so to leave that relationship and start all over again, is, it becomes very difficult for them to do that. And so, a lot of the interventions that we do um, in, in the in the program side is really helping them to become more self reliant, to come to gain self independence and self sufficiency, so that they can, um, um, you know, do things on their own. But that's a long process. I mean, it takes so long to build that up and to get victims to feel empowered enough because they've been, they've, someone has taken that power away from them for so long that it's, it's like starting all over again in your education about how to live on your own. And so I think all of the things that um, Jenny and um, Kathy shared are, are key things, but it's, it really is all of it together. Uh, well, from what I've seen with, with victims, um, and it doesn't matter what race they are, what color they are, they, they, um, the victimization in domestic violence is so real and, and um, is experienced to me the same across the board. It's just that um, feeling of taking away everything I have and I own and I know and um, depending on somebody else for that. I would like to. Oh, sorry. Okay. I would like. I would like to add um, what Jenny was saying about in our culture. You know, language is a big barrier. The immigration status, the language, uh, the culture. In our culture, you can marry forever until death uh, separate you, right? And uh, a lot of families they want to the violence to stop, not to end their their marriage there. Uh, they are the fathers or the kids. They want to continue trying to save the marriage. And, and because they don't know how the system works, they are afraid to get out and ask for help. They are afraid to call the police because instead of, call, of, of, of the police um, sometimes help them, the, the partner, if they speak very well English, they blame the uh, the women uh, for the domestic violence, and they ended up having problems with law, and and that is is very afraid, very difficult for women to take the action to to call the police. And another thing that is happening is a lot of people said, "Oh, 
why you don't call the police and make a report. Uh, but what people don't tell them is when they do the report, they have to leave the home sometimes. They have to go to a shelter. And in the shelter, if there is no one that speaks Spanish, how are they going to explain the system? They are afraid, they feel alone with the kids and uh, they ended up going back to the perpetrator because they don't have another uh, uh, family member close or the system around them. They, uh, they don't know how that works. If, uh, if they don't have a, a caseworker or a victim advocate or a CHW that can guide them to the, through the process, they ended up going back to, to, the, to, the, uh, to the perpetrator because they don't have they don't see another option. They don't know if, if there are resources around them. And, and it, is, it is very difficult because the culture part is, is it is a key, right? Like they, they don't want to leave the, their families because they learn that they have to do whatever it takes to save their marriage. And sometimes when we talk to families, it's, it's that, that uh, little component, cultural component is very hard uh, to break it, right? And to guide the women to go out and, and make sure that even if they are in the, in the shelter, this is the best way that uh, they're going to get out because they're going to receive all the resources. They are afraid to be in a, in a shelter because for us, for example, shelter is for, for a homeless person, right? Like they don't have anything else and, and the pride, right? Like, oh, you came to this country to make your dreams come true, you know, and, and ended up in that situation, the cultural part, it, it is very hard to, to break those barriers. Um, and that is my, in my experience working with a, a lot of women with domestic violence. Wow. Very complex. I think we have questions from Tatiana and Valentine. Yeah. Um, I had a comment. During COVID, we saw the increase of victims unable to leave because there are no shelters that take pets. I believe at the time when I came into this information, the closest one was in Las Vegas, one for like Colorado, Vegas. Mm -hmm. Uh, Wyoming. So if somebody is very attached to their pet, you would imagine they cannot leave the pet behind, right? So um, that's just something that came to light strongly with the pandemic. That's all my comment. Thank you. Wow, and sometimes you. in the shelters, they don't accept teenagers. I have a woman that uh, she had a, a little girl and a teenager boy. And in the shelter, they said, oh, you can stay with the girl, but he cannot stay in the shelter because he's a teenager. And she said, oh no, I cannot do that. I'm going to live in my car with my two kids, but I'm not going to leave one behind. And, and, and that, that, that barrier is, is very hard for women to choose one kid over the other one. That's unheard of. Valentin? I have had uh, conversations with uh, several women who who are in domestic abuse situation, um, for example, where they have been raped by their husband. However, uh, in their culture, there is nothing like raping your wife. You, you, how can you rape your wife? She's your wife. You know, you, you have sex with her whenever you want it, either she wants it or not. So this concept of not being able to understand when uh, the abuse is happening, the definition of abuse is also one of the reasons that um, some women are stuck because they don't believe that an abuse has happened. Thank you, Valentin. Wow. Um, here's a, a comment in the chat from Farida. In the Afghan community, the predominant religion is Islam. In Islam, women, women are allowed to work if they want to keep their income while men are required to use their income for the family needs. 
Both are allowed to ask for divorce if the other is not meeting their needs spiritually, emotionally, physically, etc. It is seen that women are more caring and thus entrusted in the education and growth of children within the family. There are many other specific rules and regulations, but that would be a long discussion. Sadly, due to cultural um, patriarchy views, women are not being treated the way they should be with the issues. Majorly, oh, oh I just lost my part. Oh, okay. Majorly in education and financial domestic abuse, but also physical or spiritual. Thank you, Farida. Mm -hmm. And Maria says, on average, in domestic violence, a person will attempt to leave on average of seven or more times before fully leaving. And that is very true. I um, have a spiritual daughter who was in a domestic violence situation. And she had left, I think it was her third or fourth time leaving. And she quoted that statistic to me and said, you know, it's average seven times people will leave before they actually stay gone. And of course I had to ask her if she was going to, if she was reaching for that number before she actually got the message that she should stay gone now, but you know. So that's an interesting number. They attempt seven times. It's very difficult. It's not as easy as I'm out of here. There are so many ways that you're connected to this person this family, this situation that it, it, it's real, it's hard. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, Ashley says, an additional thought to that question is the psychological difficulties aside from financial and support dependency. There's a lot of information on the cycle of this for the victim and where they might be psychologically that leads them to staying with their partners. That's a very good point. Ashley, would you like to um, elaborate on that a little bit more? Uh, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know why it sounds so crazy. <laughs> um, I don't have any like direct information on that, but uh, my background is in psychology. Um, and there's like cycles of abuse, right? Like the partner can be really great afterwards um, like they have the honeymoon phase and I think it can be really easy like I think all of those things are very important as well and I think it adds to the cultural aspect but on top of that there's also just the the basic issue of people trying to leave partners that are abusing them in any way um, and a lot of that comes from something that was also mentioned like the dependency and feeling like they have nothing without their partner um, there's lots of like aspects of how they've been beaten down emotionally to the point where they don't know how to leave. And also, I think if you still have love for this person and you want to work on things, then there's that entire barrier as well. Very good. Thank you. You know, there is that, I'm sorry, baby, I'll never do that again, you know, right after, you know, and it gets to the point where you say, okay, not again until the next time. Uh, Oretta says, so true, Ashley, domestic violence has different forms of abuse, emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual, and financial. And most times victims are experiencing all at the same time. Families get separated. That is so profound, so true. Um, Oretta, is, any, is there anything you would like to add to that or ex expound on? Sorry, I was just... Um, <laughs> answering comments in the chat, but um, we had a lot of, you know, on a cultural side, like for Pacific Islanders, the shame is, is more huge than the abuse itself. So for me to come out of a relationship saying that I divorced my husband or I left him is, is a, a harder conversation for us to have in our family than you know, um, he's beating me, like, even if it's not physical. And so it's, we already have a lot of things that are taboo to talk about in our, in our culture. And so, and this is one of them. And, and um, the, just the whole belief that what happens behind closed doors stays behind closed doors. You don't talk about that stuff outside of your home or with anyone outside of your family, because again, you will bring shame to our family name. And that, um, is huge in the Pacific Island community 
because we hold very high chief titles for villages and communities and fam very big families, that shame is huge. And, and to bring shame to that name in any way is looked um, down upon. And so for, for a lot of our women, even men, um, it's hard to just even say that I'm thinking about leaving because she's abused or she's abusing me. Wow, okay. Well, there's a, a question in that kind of piggybacks off of that um, about accepting the Pacific Islanders accepting abuse. Is that because of the stigma or the shame? It seems to be accepted. It's not accepted, but there's a, it depends, the definition of abuse is, it can be different for everybody in, in the Pacific Islands because mm -hmm. there's discipline, which we feel like you need that to you know, stay straight. I mean, I got disciplined a lot when I was younger, but um, um, when we came to America, it's like, there's a limit to that discipline and then it's abuse. There's a lot of families that don't know that because that's how they got raised back in the islands. Like whatever was around you, you got beat with that. And, you know, uh, we talk about this a lot in our, in our, um, our programs, because when Polynesians get, get together, we, like for me, when we were in high school, we used to laugh about how we, we got beat up because we did something bad the night before. And, and the stories that you hear, I won't say here because you could probably turn my mom in for abuse. <laughs> um, it, they were things that were funny to us because it, it was experienced in all of our households. So for us, it was normal. Um, but then, you know, we would go to these things and people would be like, hey, you know, that's called child abuse. No one should ever treat you that way or hit you that way or hit you with any kind of object. And, um, you know, a lot of, of, our, of us who were born and raised in the, in the U.S., now we're starting to think like, oh, yeah, you can't hit me like that <laughs> because we never seen it that way. And so the perspectives are different. And it's a hard question to ask because there is so much debate in our community about what that means what disciplining with love means. Um, and then, but when we share that, it comes off as it's defined in the US as abuse. So it's hard. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the same with the African-American community. It's the same. Um, that too. In the Hispanic community, it's common, like, yeah, it's common to see like, oh, how, how did your dad or your parents discipline you? Like it's super common, you know? And we came here and like, oh, that is child abuse. It's different here for sure. So I wanted to just make sure I say that, that it's not, it's not something that is accepted. We don't want to hurt or abuse or teach our kids to abuse people. Um, but again, just because of a lot of different factors and dynamics and different families where you were raised, all of those things play into if there's abuse in, 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 the, in the household or if someone is um, experiencing abuse. But for like me, I, I will say proudly that um, the discipline I received, like it made me who I am today. I've learned from that discipline and without it, I don't know <laughs> where I would be. Same, yes. Um, I did not grow up with timeout being any kind of option. So I don't even know if my mother knew what the timeout was. <laughs> she said timeout while I go get a belt or something. But <laughs> she, yeah, so yeah, I get it. Um, Yvette, Dr. Lopez says, sometimes family does not ask, why didn't you leave? They ask, why didn't you stay? And that makes it harder. Ooh, family, family pressures. It's very difficult. Oh, and consent, Oretta said. Um, Tile, you had your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you for giving me some time. I just I wanted to add um, to Oretta's comment um, is I, one of the experiences that I had. Um, so um, the nonprofit that I, I worked for um, is heavily uh, deals with domestic violence. And I think one of the questions or we we had uh, engaged with community in um, a needs assessment, like a questionnaire to kind of gauge um, domestic violence awareness and understanding. And um, when we asked the question flat out, um, 
do you know someone who has experienced domestic violence? And most of the answers were no, but rephrasing the question of, oh, have you experienced um, anyone being hit or, you know, get a bloody nose or a black eye by a partner? Um, that was more so answered as yes. And I think um, back to the question of um, why don't people leave? Or I think the perspective, like Oretta said, is um, understanding what that domestic violence looks like. And, uh, to hear that and to classify what you're going uh -oh. you that perception of saying, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not uh, of domestic violence. So I think changing that paradigm or the ideology kind of helps in having conversations. Thank you, Tile. Uh, Ms. Kathy, can I jump in and mention something as well? Yes. Um, this is Maria, and I just kind yes. of wanted to second what Tila was saying is just the perspective. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, most of the conversations that are around domestic violence usually are um, have a focus on the victim of, you know, these tough questions. Why are you staying? Why didn't you leave, et cetera? Um, but uh, we see less of the, the conversation around the abuser. Um, you know, why is it that they're acting this way? Why are they, um, you know, prone to violence or why are, why are they just abusing their partner in any way? Um, and so I feel like that in itself as well, just changing the perspective of um, refocusing the attention away from the victim and, and really focusing on, um, on the continued, um, you know, um, how do you say it? Like just on the continued um, actions of the actual abuser. And um, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. We have a, um, in the chat, we have Farida. I think something that needs to be talked about more since I agree we have more information now about how people get abused. Rather, we need to focus on how abusers are created. What trauma did they face? What mental illness is predominant? What evil thoughts have made them into who they are? Wow, which people are perpetrating this violence often? How do we initiate these conversations, research and community programs to break these cycles, to identify people with these tendencies before they become serial domestic abusers ooh, throughout their lives? Oh, Farida, I love that question. Anyone out there that would love to... Um, speak on this? Um, uh, Kathy, I would like to add that women not, are not the only one that are abused. We have a lot of men that suffer domestic violence and, and the stigma around them to, to talk about what has happened to them. It, it is very deep, right? And, and they suffer in, in silence because they feel like there is no programs for them to, to support them when they are in that situation. And, and as Farida was saying, bring those conversations, not just about women, but about men too, uh, because they are suffering in silence. That's a good point. Prove thee, prove thee. Um, sorry, I'm butchering your name. You responded that you believe it's not something to be addressed just as the, at an individual level. Societal mm -hmm. level uh, strategies are needed to curb the cause. Would you like to expound on that a little bit? I firmly believe that just blaming an individual for the consequences is not the solution. I always think the root cause always lies like I mentioned, it's society level or sometimes just policy level, because it takes a village to impart qualities, discipline, or social behaviors in an individual. It's not just between those four walls or just their family. So that's the reason I put that comment. Okay, so do you want to answer your own question about acclimatizing to the culture of the United States in that case? 
I think I had the same question even last <laughs> time during the session. I know there is no straight or direct answer for that, but I'm just curious what sort of efforts are being made in addressing that weird complex situation. I just wanted to hear from you guys. I can add that what what we've been working on really is, you know, we've we've found that, you know, that um how can I it's so complex, but you know, when when we're looking at our community who have migrated here and the difference of the cultures, people are struggling to to figure out how they fit in or where they fit in. Identity has become a huge issue for our Pacific Islanders living in the states or who have grown up in the states that have you know, um, their grandparents who are raising them from a very different time. And so trying to balance out and or say this culture is right or better than this culture, that's what I think our approach has not been to do that, but to say, take the strengths of your culture and, and, and use that. Don't lose yourself in this Western culture and change everything because that's part of who you're, you are. That's your identity. So for a lot of the work we're doing with, um, uh, like second, third generation um, families here is that work is is really giving them a sense of pride of who they are and where they come from and, and teaching them that culture, but saying, you know, we understand that living here is a different thing. It's, you know, things are different, but just know that this is the culture that you come from. And, you know, we're working with a hunter students. I don't know if you all know about the shooting that happened a month ago. And one of the things that I agree with you on is that this is a societal issue. We, we are here in this school trying to help these kids build up their, um, their um, sense of identity. And, and then here we have a system that's telling, telling us, oh, we can't do anything. That's not a district problem. That's a cultural problem. This is not a cultural problem. That didn't happen because they're Pacific Islanders or they're you know, refugee or Latino. That happened because of the system. And then everybody wants to come in and, and, and approach this in a way that let's teach them about gang mentality. Let's teach them. No, that's not how we solve this. And so um, that is what oppresses us as a community because we are already stereotyped as, oh, that's what, that's what they do. They do that to themselves. And so we can't help anything that they do. And so I think that's, um, a lot of education to me, but it's going to take a while. I mean, this is not going to be solved in a night or even in a week, but it's something that we have to continue to educate others about who we are and, and that we aren't just violent people who go around killing others. Um, it, it comes from this, I think, systemic racism and oppression that we have to deal with every day um, that contributes to a lot of that. Just to follow up on that. If people are still saying that it's a cultural thing and it's from this community or something, do you think we are failing at efforts of building strong allyships, like inter-community conversations or you know, relationships? Oh, do you yeah. think that's one of the reasons? Yeah, I, it's part of the reason, but, but I will say this as well, the system banks and relies on that division. Everything that we have done to bring everybody together, there's always something that divides us, whether it's funding, whether it's, you know, I want to leave this out and, you know, they're not good enough to do this. So even in the work we're doing as community health workers and bringing our community communities together, we also recognize that within our communities, there's a lot of division. People have their own perspectives of how things should be done. But that to me even is something that is, it happens to us from the systems, always trying to say, well, we'll help this, this group of people versus this group of people. And now everybody's fighting for resources. And, and so it's hard for us to come together and agree on one thing, but who says we have to all agree on one thing? I think it's okay for us to work on different things where they're at and then come together you know, on the, the common ground that we have all together, which is community, the health of the community. And that's not something, to me, that's something that is very Western because back home in our villages, everything is decided on by a council. And the council is represented by chiefs that represent different communities and different families. And then whatever they decide there um, together is what happens in, our, in the village. 
And we can't do that here. There's too many uh, Indians, not enough chiefs, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a very powerful point. Tatiana, you have your hand up. Yes, as to the what steps can we take? I think our meeting here today is one of the steps to talk, to have a safe space, to learn different perspectives of why. So I'm proud of those of you attending. I want to also encourage our scholars to look at the modules and do a quick search. If this is a topic of interest, we have many modules on domestic violence, domestic violence as it appears in military families, domestic violence in other populations. So I encourage you to fulfill credits looking at the modules that we have on this. But this is a first step. This is how we advance knowledge and how we learn from each other and how we can make a difference. I think um, I have never in my 22 years here at university attended a forum like this with community and future providers speaking about a hard topic like this. Thank you. Valentine, did you have a question? No, it, it got answered. I'm good, thank you. Oh, thank you. There is a question about, um, is there a process for undocumented citizens or people to get into a shelter? Or how can they get into a shelter being undocumented? Um, I, I, I would like to uh, say something about that before I leave because I have another thing. Um, you know, every time that uh, we call um, a shelter, the first thing that we ask if they have someone that, that is, speaks Spanish, right? And in the past, it was, it was so hard to find someone that speaks Spanish. I'm glad that that improved now. Uh, they, um, fortunately for us, they don't ask for the status uh, to get into a shelter. They, if they have a room available, they can go um, in, into the shelter. There is a process because they, the caseworker need to see if they, if they have another, um, resources available before go to the shelter, right? And sometimes it take a little uh, longer. Uh, if it's an emergency that the women is already on the streets with the kids, uh, they have a priority, but uh, they don't ask for, uh, for any status, immigration status to, to get into, into the shelters. And, um, you know, sometimes I remember, uh, I had one experience at the beginning, when I started working with uh, domestic violence as a CHW, uh, you know, you want to help everybody. You want to take the, the women home with the kids and uh, you put it in your house and, and help them, right? And I remember one of this uh, caseworker at YWCA, uh, she was telling me the best thing that you can do for this woman if you really care about her is uh, bring her to the shelter. And I said, no, why? I, I want to help her, right? Uh, and she said, yeah, you have to do it because uh, at the shelter, she's going to receive another resources uh, to help this woman to get it on their feet. And, um, and I said, okay, I'm going to trust the process. Uh, it was hard for me and I bring her to the shelter. Fortunately today, uh, she is a woman, an independent woman uh, with an apartment, with the kids, uh, she has a work. And at that time she was undocumented and now she is a citizen. Uh, and because of that decision to take it to the shelter. Um, sometimes it's hard to trust because we are a minorities, right? And we don't trust the systems and um, it is hard. But um, I had a good experience with that women uh, and, and that, was, that was wonderful, but I, I'm going to say from 10 women that I bring to the shelter, uh, like two uh, are cases like that, that they are really move forward. But um, a lot of them, they go back to the perpetrator. And one of the things that I always said as a community health worker is, is your decision. I'm not going to tell you what to do because if I tell you what to do, I'm in the position of the perpetrator again. I taking your power away. No matter what you decide, if you want to go back, it's your decision, but I'm going to be here to help you when you are ready to go out again. And I'm here with the resources. 
And I learned that um, when you tell the women, oh, you have to do this, or you assume that the women need to do that, you are taking the role of the, um, of the perpetrator and you are taking her power away from her. And um, I just want to, to share that with you and thank you for letting me uh, share. Thank you, Jeanette. <clears throat> Um, there's a comment from Teresa. I was hoping that she would expound on a um, little bit more what Jeanette was talking about, the YWCA and family shelters, women and children. Hi, yes. Um, sorry, I that was a really long comment. Um, well, yeah, I just kind of wanted to chime in and I used to work with the YWCA, the women's shelter and um, I was probably one of a few of the staff that did speak Spanish as well, but we had um, a lot of folks from different um, backgrounds that were represented staff wise. Um, so we were lucky, but um, I did want to say it was really heartbreaking to see the families come in, um, you know, and some of them were, you know, they'd come in and out over and over again, or they'd stay in the long term housing. Um, and while, you know, the mission of YWCA is to empower women. Um, they would do, you know, like vocational training, education, um, you know, work applications and all these things. And then they also had, um, you know, free daycare for the kids after school. Um, it always made me wonder, like, we're doing all these great things, but there's only so much we can do, right? Um, when families don't have the means to really escape a perpetrator or, you know, move states or get their own housing. Um, and you know, get us have stability in their lives. Um, afterwards, th th that's the reason they you know go back to the shelters. Um, it's one of the resources they have. Um, and so, I guess with that, um, I also wonder if I've seen a couple of grants here and there where they're trying to have that conversation of how do we um, get men to talk about these things? You know, there's a lot of efforts with like fatherhood ads that I've seen about like being present in, in, in your children's lives and things like that. And I'm wondering if that's a campaign or kind of a vision that, that um, we could start kind of envisioning um, for men as well. Um, because I also think that there's a lot of limitations like how Rita had said, these systemic um, barriers that, that happen, like there's only as much that the justice system can do and, um, and, those, and, the, and those folks also have their own, you know, plethora of problems that they also deal with. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of, I don't know, sorry, my mind's all over the place, but I'm just trying to think of like, do we know of, of program services, workshops, things that we can, you know, actually do as a community um, and not just separately by ethnic identity or culture, but as a community uh, as a whole to um, kind of speak with men and, and um, I mean, I know that men aren't the only perpetrator that women are too, but um, kind of open that conversation up in a more, um, I don't know, therapeutic way, I guess. Okay. I think we have Tile. Tile wanted to do a contribution. Oh, hi there. Sorry. Thank you so much. I don't mean to take up more space from the students, but um, I think Pictar has um, a campaign that they're currently working on that can easily be expanded to other folks. It's, um, it, so in the Pacific Islander um, community, they're, um, they're known for Gava, Gava circles or a place, um, and Oretha can explain it more because she's a cultural expert, but um, essentially it's a group of uh, men, a talk story space for a group of men to come in together and talk about um, things that we can do to be true allies and to combat uh, domestic violence, uh, but also to uh, kind of uh, boil down on uh, the, uh, the stigma of being uh, a victim or being a survivor of domestic violence for men um, and just have safe spaces to um, kind of unpack those issues. So I think um, from a community perspective, that might be a good place to start um, uh, normalizing these kinds of conversations, right? Um, like you had alluded to, and um, I think that's a step in the right direction. Okay, thank you. 
Um, there's a question for Maria about elaborating, please, on why it takes seven times to leave. And what do we look for in these abused patients? What are some, some common signs to, to look for when we can tell that they're ready to leave? Yeah, I mean, I can try to answer that. I don't know if I would have the best answer for you. Um, you know, that's just from information and resources that I've collected as well myself um, in helping clients um, just obtain additional information. Um, and I think it just touches a little bit on everything that we've already talked about, um, the dependency of, of financial, emotional, um, and psychological um, additionally, you know, the immigration situation uh, with Hispanic families that I have seen. Um, so I, I don't really fully have an answer for you, but um, um, I think, and we touched about this a little bit more towards the beginning, but really the shame and guilt um, psychologically has a lot more to do with the reasons of why people are, um, uh, you know, returning to their abuser. Um, and one additional point that I think I've been thinking about as we've had, we've continued the conversation is really the danger of leaving. Um, uh, one of the reasons that uh, the, you know, people do return, the victim does return to the abuser is um, really safety for their lives. Um, uh, and possibly, uh, you know, that's the major um, result of like the, the statistics that I received of like, you know, it takes about seven times to leave. Because even though, you know, we think like maybe um, the victim needs more support uh, with however support may look for them, um, you also still have the abuser who is also um, not willing to let that individual go, right? There's, um, there's threats and um, oftentimes they really don't leave because they, they have been threatened. And we have also seen this in various cases um, that individuals, you know, end up being, um, end up being killed, murdered um, by their abusers. And so um, that's, that's kind of what I would, I would have to answer on that. But if anybody else wants to expand, um, additionally, uh, from that question, I just wanted to, you know, conclude, and we've talked about it a little bit just regarding financial, um, but really, uh, um, the education piece, um, you know, um, oftentimes we think that, uh, underserved communities or people who, you know, are low income or, you know, um, culture really plays, um, a, a, a big, um, issue in domestic violence. Um, and so we really don't think, you know, that people who are probably middle class, high class, or educated, um, you know, would even experience uh, something as domestic violence. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that that does get highlighted, um, that, it, you know, domestic violence really doesn't discriminate in, in that aspect. Thank you. Very good point. Very good point. Um, here's a question for the students. How comfortable are you engaging with patients regarding domestic violence or abuse? I would say I will need some training. Okay, anyone else? I think we are taught a series of questions to ask, but to really um, ask them in a way that allows people to open up is not something I feel super confident in. Okay, any other student with the... We have a comment from Oscar. He says, I would feel a little intimidated because I would feel like this could be the start of their family breaking apart. Well, that's very valid. That's very valid. Um, I, I have a comment, sir. I work, I currently work in the emergency department. So I don't know if I would feel comfortable if I were in like a clinic setting, but in my current setting, I mean, we ask every single person who comes in about abuse and violence. And then, you know, usually it's because someone has an injury that they're seeking care. And then we also have, you know, PD presence right there and know how to get people involved. So my current job setting, I feel pretty comfortable and Hopefully, 
we'll continue to learn how to feel more comfortable. So um, thank you for that, Sherry. How, what kind of questions would you ask if you're, if you're assessing the person and you're suspecting abuse? How would you approach and how would you ask? What kind of questions? Well, I'm probably gonna find out I'm asking the wrong questions, but <laughs> so you guys can tell me what. So um, uh, my basic question I start with is just, do you feel safe at home? You know, and then I'll kind of go into, you know, any, and I try to include like, I'll say, you know, anyone hurting you in any way, physically, sexually, emotionally, financially. Um, that's kind of how I start it. And then, you know, if I haven't done this myself, but we had a patient come with, you know, just some pretty substantial bruising on her eye. And, um, the doctor did a really good job of her partner was with her getting the partner out and kind of asking her just by herself, like anything else happening, um, you know, just making sure you have opportunities to get people alone, which we do a lot in the emergency department. If we are suspicious that something's going on, we will try to separate the patient from whoever has brought them in so that we can have a chance um, to let them know it's a safe space and that they can tell us anything and try to give them an opportunity to open up to us. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sherry, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up um, because like, um, in, in, in my community, sometimes if you ask people if they live in a safe home, um, it might be confusing to understand what safe mean uh, because they might take it like, as long as they, 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 they are no thieves in the house, there are no gangs in the house, for them, that's what a safe environment means. Um, they might not understand that um, by the, the partner being um, an abuser, it can mean not a safe environment. So um, sometimes we just have to go deeper and make sure the, the person understand the, the word, especially for those of us whose English is not our first language. Um, sometimes we, we confuse or we don't understand well the, the, the word you might be using in a, yeah, thank you. Okay, anyone else while we're on this topic? We have a question for Ryan Benali. Ryan, in Native American communities, how is this experience and who takes charge in the reservation if there is a domestic violence offense? Well, um, in this experience, there's actually kind of a issue with multi-jurisdictional uh, issues, you know, being that, you know, there's the topic of <clears throat> tribal sovereignty, um, who does a person report to, either the tribal police or the <clears throat> um, county, you know, uh, the sheriff's office, or even, you know, um, you know uh, or anybody else, uh, you know, that would be out there. So um, I think that could be a, a, adherence, or excuse me, an obstruction for the person that's reporting the victim. So. <clears throat> um, a lot of times, um, the the issue that we're discussing today, it's kind of uh, really um, complicated because in these some of these homes, you know, um, there's multi generational families that live in these homes. So obviously, you know, you know, it's not just the victim that's exposed to this kind of violence. Is you know, you have the children, you have the mothers, the fathers of the of the husband and wife or the girlfriend and boyfriend as well. So, you know, <clears throat> I think that's how it could get really complex at the, at the same time. So also uh, going back to the issue of, you know, these complicated jurisdictional issues, um, you know, some of the, <clears throat> you know, there's a high percentage of Native American women who um, experience these um, types of violence from, partners who are not Native American, you know, um, I think it's like one in five, I think it was. So, you know, it, it's very complex. 
for Native Americans. And, but then overall, you know, um, from any other uh, group or demographic, um, Native Americans do experience a higher rate, um, <clears throat> sometimes twice as much, sometimes, you know, three times as much than other demographics. So uh, I think that it's something that's of concern and, you know, um, <clears throat> it's a subject that's really taken seriously. All right, we have a participation from Tania Oliveira. Oliveira, it says uncomfortable screening, but need to refer to our CHW for resources. I always ask if they live in a safe place. I think we touched a little bit about what is safe place, but would you like to add Tania a little bit more comments about the screening and resources that you would like to know more about? Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Yeah, so I want to know, um, so in my line of work, I don't sit down with the patient that has, uh, that is suffering from domestic violence, and I don't know the resources, but I know our CHWs at our clinic are very good about those, and I know they have resources. So if I screen and I find that, yes, they are having issues with those, um, domestic violence and they don't know where to go or things like that, I always grab my community health workers because they're like my lifesavers. Um, and as far as screening, I think one important thing is to get the trust of the patient. Like I've, I've met with people that I had the gut feeling that yes, not everything is right, but they're not telling me. And maybe that's because they don't trust me yet. So maybe it's one of those cases where they leave seven times and come back, and I hope that one day they'll trust me enough to tell me what's going on. But I always try to, you know, at least screen and open up the topic in the hopes that they will say something. Totally. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that contribution. And we have another comment for Oscar Samudio. It must be upsetting if husband and wife go together for an injury appointment do they ask the question to the both of them or they, do they walk the husband out of their can be honesty? I think we, we kind of touch on that question to on that comment. And with the, most of the providers try to separate them. All right. We have some questions about from the audience saying, can we have some info on victims of sex trafficking? Oreta, do you have a comment about it? Oh, sorry, um, not the sex trafficking. Just wanted to um, say that um, for, a lot of, for a lot of you in the clinical um, area, it's gonna be hard to have these conversations, especially to do screening in the environment that you're in because there's, there's not a lot of privacy. So a lot of times when we're doing screening, we, do, we have to like say, hey, you know, um, this is routine for us that, you know, we have to ask these questions to everybody that comes in. The transparency is one very key to, to, um, to asking those other questions and then can lead to, you know, later on when, when you're able to take the, the patient to the back, whether you're doing weight or, you know, what, I mean, I know the MAs do that, but sometimes we've had providers take them themselves. So, or the CHWs, um, if they suspect that something's wrong, take them to the back and say, let's get your weight as if it was a normal, you know, um, routine thing. And then when we're in the back there, because the perpetrator may be in the waiting room or in the exam room, take them back there and then ask, questions that we need to ask like do you feel safe is this is this um you know do, do you need help with anything that I can help you with and they'll say in the back but when they come back to the front well we'll not say anything but at least you know and so we've had to like be very creative on how we ask or and when we ask because the the um safety is a huge issue so a lot of times that's what we'll do or um but but making it so that it's not so obvious to the to the person that the abuser, um, because they, and the, the thing too is when, I, what I love in a lot of providers offices now is that they they take you first and they say, do you wanna bring someone with, one with you? Let's just do this um, you know routine thing and then we'll bring them back to the room when we put you in the room. 
that gives us time to go and find that out and ask those private questions before we bring back the family member to sit with them in the room. Um, and so I just wanted to share some of the ways that we've had to adjust um, when it comes to DV and, and screening. Thank you, Reta, that was very valuable. And do we have somebody who will share information on sex trafficking? to keep on going with the questions. Uh, sorry, I wanted to just say too, for human trafficking and sex trafficking, it's really hard for Pacific Islanders. Um, you know, as we are learning all of this stuff and what's happening, there, there have been a lot of incidents that we're now seeing where, I mean, if you look at the definition of what that means and, and, and you're, you're taking someone and promising them something and but not giving it to them while they're here. Well, we, we've done that a long for a long time, bringing family members from the islands to America and saying that, you know, we're gonna bring you here on a temporary visa. We're gonna get you a job, um, you know, and all of that stuff. And we're gonna help you go to school and all of that stuff. And then um, when we get them here, they're not paid. We don't take them to school. They, they kind of become a family member that just lives at the house and helps do things around the house or, it shows up in a way where um, in the labor field where we call it yate or um, in Tongan, but it's the construction field where we bring a lot of people, their papers expired, and then they're working for us in the construction company without any papers and they're not being paid right. They're not being you know, given insurance, all of that stuff. That all falls under the, the definition of human trafficking. And sometimes it, it becomes sex trafficking for a lot of our community members, but for, for a lot of community members who are coming over, they don't see that. All they see is the opportunity to go to the US and to have a better life than they have in the islands. And, and, and for a lot of members who are bringing them over, they don't see that as human trafficking either because they should be grateful that we brought them to America to have this better life. And so there's a lot of education that's still going on um, with our community members to, to make sure that they know that is illegal. <laughs> and so the other thing is domestic violence and abuse is also something we're trying to say that is illegal. What you did back home is not the same here. And so just so much education, but um, I'm glad that we have the space to share these kinds of insight because there's a lot of people who just see black and white or it's law and not law. And you're doing this illegally and not understanding that I may not understand what that means at all. Like this is normal for the way I live and where I come from. So who are you to call, tell me you're gonna call the police on me because I'm, you know, this is human trafficking. And so um, that's my contribution about that. <laughs> Thank you, Oretta. Um, Oretta, or if I can also just add that Diana, sorry to squeeze in, um, to jump in. But I, I wanted to touch on similar um, situation around immigration. Um, and it, this isn't just with the Hispanic community, right? Like, um, but I think uh, from what I've seen with immigration issues is oftentimes um, both the abuser and the victim are in an immigration situation where, you know, if one were to call the other one, they would, they would um, feel that they were in danger. Um, and additionally, um, um, and maybe this isn't really talked about as much, and so I can't fully generalize, but in the community, um, oftentimes um, immigration is, is like also a way, or domestic violence is also a weird, scary way to get your process through for immigration. And so sometimes when people are experiencing domestic violence, you know, the community or the stigma is saying, oh, they're only doing that because they want to get their immigration papers, right? And so not believing the victim that they're actually going through this and that they only want to use it to their benefits for immigration is also a, a conversation that, um, it, you know, happens in the Hispanic community, um, you know, and that's very detrimental, right? Because it's like, we're not, you know, it's like the Me Too movement. We are not believing that um, the situation is real. And we're thinking that families or communities are just 
really um, taking advantage of the system, right? Um, I just wanted to add to that. Thank you, Maria. That is very valuable, that you visa. I heard that from a lot of the clients, like they are afraid because they're gonna be judged. Like they are just taking that benefit of the U visa or victim visa if they, is they is if they process that the domestic violent situation. Okay, we have a comment from Farida. Let's see the Farida says, I agree for many refugees and immigrants, they are promised work, but instead are forced into hard labor, sex work, or housework without pay. They are blackmailed due to being given fake papers and they are even paid for. So fear the ju ju judicial system for more, even though I could help them get out of the abusive situation. And Oreta also asked, we definitely have a lot of work to do. And the issue is always resources, not just financial resources, but capacity and education about this issue. That is huge. That is huge. We also have, what are the, what are, we have a question for the, from the audience. What are the preferred resources to help each community? Let's see all the community health workers from all the communities. What are the preferred resources? for domestic violence? Definitely the, the YWCA. It's a great resource. They're downtown. They offer housing and other things. And it is a trusted place by our community. Any others from other people? From our community? Mm -hmm. I know that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Maria. Oh, thank you, Purdue. I know that we also have South Valley Services, which is um, an additional nonprofit organization. Um, they oftentimes um, are part of like working with presentations with community partners and showing presentations. So South Valley Services um, in West Jordan. Also, Tile said Pacific Islander Knowledge to Action Resources, Pixar. That's a great resource too. I've been hearing so many good things about that organization too as well. What about Valentine? So one of the resources um, for our African refugees is actually working um, close with community leaders and community health workers because all the women that I, I have seen who were able to to go to the shelter or to go to it, like YWCA or other places is because they had a conversation with somebody they trust in uh, from the community first. Um, there are very few women in our communities who decide that this place is a safe place for me. Number one, it could uh, also be the, the food that they are served when they get there. Uh, it's not ethnic food. It's not. It's uh, it's food that they are not um, familiar with. So sometimes uh, they can that can be a barrier because they, they don't feel like them or their kids will have food that they will be able to eat. So we, what we have been doing, we do workshops in the community, and we have a one 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 on one conversation with uh, uh, families if we realize that there is a domestic situation. And then we, we talk about these resources so that they can feel comfortable and they can feel connected. So I would advise if you are working with any African uh, refugee family and you, you realize that there is domestic violence and you would like maybe uh, them to go to the shelter. I would advise you to go through community leaders and community health workers so they can help you in this conversation. One thing I would say um, for providers, because you won't remember a lot of these resources and, and, and they change all the time, um, is, is know the people in your team or in your organization or in the hospital that may know them like the social worker or the CHW and, and, um, and use them as a resource as well. 
but also recognize that, you know, you now are a resource <laughs> after having this conversation. I think there's a lot more that you can provide that, than other providers um, in regards to um, resources because you understand now a little bit more about different communities and the barriers that they face. Because not a lot of the resources are good for every community. It, it really depends. We have a comment from Chile. Sex human trafficking is a huge issue in Utah. There is a large governor's task force that meets bi-monthly to engage with CBOs. Uh, CBO stands for community-based organizations on collaborative efforts. Our major issue is housing and providing all other resources to thrive. Thank you, Chile. Thank you. And thank you, Tatiana, for putting those resources in the chat the websites. I wanted to touch back um, on what Janet had shared with us earlier. And I know previously, um, Sarah from Alliance uh, normally is on these conversations as well with our group. But, um, you know, at one point they really touched on how religion plays a lot into um, whether it's uh, domestic violence or kind of a cultural perspective. Um, I'm not that knowledgeable about religion, but I did want to just kind of, um, you know, bring that up again, how the, um, just the perspective, or just the idea of um, what religion uh, families are really plays a lot into the, um, the type of, of roles and situations. And Dr. Yvette says, simply things, make eye contacts with the women, trans abuse person, validate them. They are so gaslighted for that comment. So mm. Oscar says, are most facilities trained on how to identify sex, human trafficking? When I was working in a clinic, I know that we were never trained on the subject and I wish we would have been. So are most facilities trained on how to identify this in your experience, community health workers? Not a lot of them. Uh a lot of medical training, but no, not a lot of social or other trainings um, for the clinical staff. But for me, because I work in a federally qualified health center, we got a lot of those trainings because of the population we served. Um, but um, because it's the, the st statistics are high for that population, but it would be something that was good to be trained across the board. I mean, because you, I mean, of course, we're not going to be experts in it, but at least a background would help you. And um, instead of like surprise situations where you don't know what to do, because that also can be a safety issue. And with that, we have come to the end of the program. And I want to first of all thank um, our um, facilitators, Ms. Kathy Wolfsfeld and Yenny Arones. Thank you so much. You did a fantastic job. And um, oh my gosh, I want to thank the students. Some of you, you know, that you were my students. I miss you. I still miss you. I see these faces. I'm like, yay. And most, and, and most importantly, also the um, CHWs, all of them, the ones that are, were here and left. Um, yeah, I'm humbled every time. Every time that we do this, I think, oof, you know, so glad that we did this session. So, um, thank you so much. And um, the next one is when, Tati? Do we have uh, that? In exactly one month, March 16, we will talk about end of life and elderly care, caregiving, as it applies to different cultures. I hope you can join us. I have placed your grades already on Canvas. Thank you, students. Please reach out if you would like to contact any of these amazing team members. Uh, then I'll be happy to connect you for your needs or your private consultations on the topic. Thank you. And thank you, Tatiana Allen Webb, for all your your um, work and, and, and your uh, like the um, energizer bunny. Um, she never stops. And, and I thank you and acknowledge you tonight. Thank you. Have a thank good you night. to all the students. Keep striving, keep striving. Keep later thank you. Later. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, I think you two should moderate everything now. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs>